Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Uh, I have two things at the top, and then I'll turn it over to the Admiral, who will give, you, uh, give us an update on what's happening on the ground in the Middle East. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Excuse me. So, as you all know, we're en route uh, to Las Vegas, where President Biden will visit the Comforters Union International Training Center to deliver remarks and announce $8.2 billion in bipartisan infrastructure law funding for passenger rail projects across the country, including the first two high-speed rail projects in the United States. By del delivering $66 billion from the bipartisan infrastructure law, the largest investment in passenger rail since the creation of Amtrak 50 years ago, President Biden is delivering on his vision to invest in America and win the global competition for the 21st century. While there, the president will also meet with the UNLV President, along with public safety and student body representatives, to personally share his condolences for those they have lost and reaffirm our support for local law enforcement, UNLV, and the broader community in the wake of this tragedy. One last thing before I turn it over. Today, we got more good economic news, as you all have seen, with 199,000 jobs created last month for a total of 14.1 million created under. President Biden. Unemployment fell to 3.7% and has been under 4% for 22 months in a row, the longest stretch in 54 years. The last time unemployment was this low for this long, this is a fun fact, Diana Ross topped the charts and the Apollo program was visiting the moon. We have more work to do. Prices are still too high, but we are making progress. Annual inflation fell to its lowest level in more than 2.5 years last month with monthly inflation of zero and Americans are feeling the results. Today we learned Americans expectations for inflation have taken have fallen. Linary consumer sentiments rose 13 percent so far this month and that is Bionomics in Action. A song for Diana Ross. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you brought her up. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'll give you that later um, with that we have uh, Admiral John Kirby who's going to give us an update on the Middle East and uh, take some of your questions good Admiral actually I don't have any topper uh, today so we can just get whatever's on your mind hey, uh, the UN is saying that uh, Gaza is on the full uh, on the verge of a full-blown collapse does do you uh, this White House agree with that assessment and what more can you guys do see the comments by the UN Secretary General well, look we certainly share uh, international concern uh, about the humanitarian situation in Gaza, and that's why the president is literally leading a global effort to increase the flow of humanitarian assistance uh, into Gaza. In fact, just today, another U.S. military aircraft, a C-17, landed in Egypt carrying 57,000 pounds of food, water, medicine, um, and we're working with the Israelis every single day to keep the level of fuel up going into Gaza. So uh, we're certainly mindful of the suffering of the people of Gaza, and we're doing everything we can to not just get stuff in there, but to lead an actual international effort to get stuff in. But do you agree with the assessment that it is on the verge of a full blown collapse? I, I would just say we're, we're mindful of the extreme uh, humanitarian suffering inside Gaza, and we're doing everything we can to, to help alleviate that, including, I would add, continuing to work with our Israeli counterparts uh, to be as uh, cautious, deliberate, and careful as they can in their targeting. <laughs> That if I made the um, UN uh, Security Council will vote later today on a new resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, has the president changed his mind about that? Would he support such a resolution or will he veto it? Well, I'm answer you need. Uh, Israel has said yesterday that they uh, will allow humanitarian aid to be screened through Karim Shalom. Um, can you give us some background? Um, you, the U.S. said it was at their request. Can you give us some background on how that request was made, when it was made, and also when can we expect trucks to start being screened? Yeah, all good questions. Uh, we've been talking to the Israelis now for quite some time here about uh, Karim Shalom and see if we can open up yet another avenue in, right? Um, and uh, so I couldn't give you a date certain or when, you know, the war cabinet agreed on that. That's something for the Israelis to speak to, but we're very grateful that they're moving in this direction. It was very much at our request. This was something that Secretary 
Patrick Lincoln covered in his last trip to the region, certainly something that the president has been raising with Prime Minister Netanyahu. So it's good news. Um, but we're just at the beginning of this process. The first step is to set up an inspection regime, sort of akin to what's going on down in Rafa, so that the Israelis can have a measure of satisfaction that what's getting in there is actually what's supposed to be getting in there. Um, I can't give you a, a time on the calendar when the trucks will actually start to flow, but we're obviously going to uh, uh, continue to watch this closely and, and hope uh, that those extra trucks coming from or into uh, Karim Shalom can, can start soon. It has not opened yet for screening. We're still working up the modalities of an inspection regime, but again, we hope it'll open up very, very soon. It'll it'll be a it'll be a good measure of relief. No no question. Is there any update to how many trucks are getting into Roth and Ross? Like today, um, I can tell you over the last 24 hours, it was you know less than 100, and obviously that's uh, that's not at the level that we wanted to be at. Um, we had reached. Uh, couple of hundred trucks a day during the pause. That's what we really want to get back restored. Uh, but every day, you know, they're, they're, for various reasons, it, it sort of goes up and goes down. I can tell you that there are literally dozens and dozens of trucks that are in line waiting to get in and uh, through the inspection. And well, is there a concern that the level of destruction in Gaza right now, the number of children who are getting killed, the number of their parents who are dying, is there a worry that Israel is creating new generations of, of kids who are going to grow up and, and, and be susceptible to joining groups like Hamas. I think Secretary Austin addressed that over the weekend when he talked about, you know, uh, conversations we're having with our Israelis about not, uh, not turning tactical victories into strategic defeats. Um, and so, uh, look, I, I, and the, the Israelis don't need a lecture from the United States about the threat of terrorism. Um, and the ideology that feeds that uh, those terrorist activities, uh, and the you know the the the, the need to uh, make sure this doesn't become a generational problem. Has this come up between the president and the prime minister Netanyahu? Beyond the readouts that we provided you guys on his conversations, are many of the mind militias continue to attack U.S. assets? A U.S. embassy was the latest uh, uh, target. Should we expect a stepped-up response from the U.S. on these attacks? Or anything new to share about how the U.S. plans to respond? We expect us to do what we have to do to protect ourselves, act in self-defense. We don't telegraph our punches. The officials been receptive to calls for strikes to be more precise. Have they made any adjustments, as far as you know, accordingly? I would just say that, uh, again, we've been talking to the Israelis about deliberate and precise targeting for quite some time. And as uh, we've been saying in the last few days, they have been receptive. To, uh, to our input. And they have, in fact, taken some steps uh, to, uh, to try to be more careful. For instance, their, their movement into Gaza and North Gaza was smaller than originally planned. And some of that is based on some counsel and perspective that we share. We sent over some military officers who had experience in Mosul, Fallujah, urban warfare in that environment. Um, and uh, we believe that the Israelis took that, th those lessons learned on, on board. Just in the last few days, you know, they're dropping leaflets. They're publishing a, a map of areas where people can go and not go. Um, that is the definition for a military of telegraphing your punches, and not a lot of modern militaries would do that. Now, Secretary Blinken has spoken uh, very, very frankly to this, including just yesterday. Uh, we certainly all recognize more can be done to, to try to, uh, uh, to uh, reduce civilian casualties, and we're going to keep working with our Israeli counterparts to that end. That's, is that a reflection of a reliance on uh, airstrikes as opposed to urban combat? Is, is there, are there more people dying because of airstrikes than because troops, Israeli troops on the ground move through? I to the IDF to speak to their assessment of uh, the efficacy of their operations and the, and the, and the casualties. I, I, I don't have that kind of data available to me. I mean, it depends. It's a hard question to answer because it really depends on what you're targeting and what kind of munition you're using to hit that target. Um, and I, you know, we're not getting, we're not involved in the targeting process for the Israelis, and I, I'm just not comfortable talking about that. A death toll in Gaza has now surpassed 17,000. Um, President Biden and you have previously cast doubt on those numbers. Is there any reason? Do you guys doubt those numbers, 17,000? Again, we're not. Uh, we know many, many thousands have been killed. Many, many thousands more have been uh, wounded. Um, the, the IDF has spoken to a, a casualty figure in just the last uh, few days. I would refer to them for more, you know, more specific data on that. Ukraine. Um, uh, Russia just fired 
cruise missiles at Ukraine. They hadn't done so in uh, in quite in quite some time. So, do you fear uh, we will see more of that in in the coming weeks? And is there a link with discussions dragging on here on uh, funding for for Ukraine? I think I've, I've talked about this when I was uh, with Green a couple of days ago. I mean, uh, we fully expect that the Russians will try to weaponize winter and they will try to launch additional missile strikes, particularly into Ukraine, hitting civilian infrastructure. And I don't know what everything they hit, but the idea of them launching cruise missiles into Ukraine is not a new thing. Um, and we fully expect it that as winter comes on, they will continue to do that. And we talked about that just a few days ago. I don't I, I would not, I would not tie that action to anything that's going on on Capitol Hill. This is a part of. Uh, a Russian effort by Mr. Putin to literally weaponize the winter months uh, and to try to uh, to brutalize the Ukrainian people at a time when they need, you know, heat, water, fuel. U.S. China, since the agreement to restore military to military communications, do you believe those have been adequately restored? That the appropriate officials are talking. It's I refer you to the Defense Department more specifically. My understanding is that uh, there's there's no new Minister of Defense. Uh, in China, so I know Secretary Austin hasn't had a restoration of military to military comms, and uh, uh, we're very eager to get those going at the senior levels and down to the theater commander level. Um, it's it's my understanding that they haven't been restored, and part of that uh, could be because they don't have a minister of defense. So uh, well, we certainly urge them to designate somebody soon, and uh, we're eager to get re eager to get those comms going. I mean, when you talk about all the tensions right now. You, you know, military and military communications are really important to reduce miscalculation and misunderstanding. Any updates on uh, the talks about securing uh, funding for Ukraine and Israel? I don't have any updates. Uh, you mean on Capitol Hill? I... Anything anything new to share about any progress? I don't have any progress to speak to. I don't know if you do. Well, Russian television is thanking uh, Congress. Republicans in Congress for not passing more help to Ukraine. Do you want to? I haven't seen. I, I don't typically watch Russian television, so um, so I, I certainly haven't seen uh, if that's what they're doing. Uh, but look, Karine said this pretty well yesterday. I mean, this is a great gift to Vladimir Putin uh, that we would walk away from Ukraine. He's banking on that. He's been banking on that kind of uh, development since early on in this war, because he didn't believe that the West could stay united. He didn't believe NATO could stay united. He didn't believe the United States had the staying power. Uh, so uh, while I haven't seen those television reports, it's very much in keeping with what, how Kareem characterized it yesterday. Uh, and if you care about our national security, let, let alone Ukraine's, let's, 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 let's put that aside, although they are first and foremost the victims here. If you care about our national security, you ought to see Mr. Putin for what he is. You ought to see Russia for what it is and realize that helping Ukraine, and they're not asking for boots on the ground, helping them win this war uh, is a very much in our national security interest and in the national security interest of all our allies in Europe. If he gets Ukraine, he gets right up against uh, the doorstep of NATO. And as I said the other day, if you think the cost of supporting Ukraine is high now, think about how high it's going to be in national treasure and in American blood if we have to start acting on our Article 5 commitments. Uh, Vladimir Putin, what's your comment on uh, the Russian president going for re-election? Well, that's going to be one humdinger of a horse race, isn't it? That's all I got to say on that. Staying in Russia, uh, Paul Whelan released a statement via his brother today. Uh, Paul Whelan released a statement via his brother. Um, yeah, and he said the game of diplomatic niceties and pleasant um, and pleasant dialogue needs to end, and you need to take decisive action to secure his release. Um, is there any update for him, and um, is his release still, as you've said in the past, a priority? Let me start by saying um, to the Whalen family um, uh, how much we understand uh, your anxiety, your worry, and your desire to have Paul back. Believe me, President Biden shares that. Uh, and there's not a day that goes by. I, I know it may not look like it, it may not seem like it, and it may not feel like it, but there's not a day that goes by that the president's team isn't trying to work to get Paul and Evan out of Russian jail. Uh, and we know Paul has been there now going on five years. Um, so we understand the, the, the pain and the anguish that they're going through. Um, uh, and while I, we can't detail the kinds of proposals that we're making, I can assure you that we are. In fact, just recently made a very serious proposal to see if we could get Paul and Evan out, and the Russians balked at it. So now we're at, back at the blackboard, 
and we're going to keep seeing what we can do to, to try to get him out. They, uh, they hold Paul um, at a very high standard because they've trumped up these espionage charges a- against him. Um, and they just treat him differently than they do uh, other people that, they, uh, that they're holding. And uh, we recognize that, which is why coming up with uh, a proposal that they'll accept has become, has become fairly difficult. But again, I, we don't want them to spend one more day uh, in jail. And I can assure the Whalen family that we are working in earnest to, to get him released. Thanks. Thanks, Admiral. All right. Appreciate it. <laughs> Many things are happening all at once. All right, go ahead. I've got, I've got two. Um, first off, the uh, major investment on electronic and electric trains in California. There's been an awful lot of money spent. A lot of uh, voter referendums have put money into this. Is there any fear that the the funds that President is announcing today is, is basically th- throwing good money after bad? Now, what we're seeing today, I mean, I just laid out at the top how important today is, right? How important this, how important the bipartisan infrastructure law has been to, to our, our, clearly our infrastructure and everything, uh, everything that's uh, obviously all the other provisions in there to, to build an infrastructure uh, that has been needing uh, some real attention uh, in the past couple of decades. And this is something that was done in a bipartisan way. The announcement today is huge. This is big. I mean, if you're thinking about this has not been done since like Amtrak, right? This is huge. And so um, uh, there's been bipartisan support in this. Uh, there's a lot of attention and obviously support from uh, from the electeds in, in California. And uh, look, this is the beginning. This is the beginning uh, of um, of um, of a rail that's going to make a difference just across across the country. And so I think um, I think you all will see that. You'll hear from the president directly uh, on how uh, critical and how much of a big day uh, this is, not just for this region, the region that we're going to, but across the country. Do you have any uh, comment on the, the IOC uh, and the, the Belarusian and Russian uh, athletes being allowed to compete on the Russian flag? I know this has come up. This has come up before. I just don't have anything. I don't have anything to add at this time. I have two questions on the Hunter Biden case. Any reaction to the uh, to what we saw last night, new charges, and then I have a follow up. Look, um, I mean, the president has said this before, and he will continue to say, which is that he loves his son and supports him as he continues to rebuild his life. I'm going to be really careful and not comment on this and refer you to Department of Justice or my colleagues at the White House Council, but that's what I'm going to, I'm not going to go beyond tell, telling you all what the president has said over and over again. He's proud of his son and he is him building his life back up. I know you want charges directly, but can you speak at least to the emotional toll the charges are having on the president? Just- comment beyond what I just shared. Did I speak to each other? I'm not gonna, and this is, we've been pretty consistent on this. I'm not gonna comment on private conversation that the president has with his family members. One more on this, um, only because you said it before, I just wanna re-up in, in light of these new uh, charges. Um, you said before that the president would not pardon his son. Is that still the case? Nothing has changed. That is still the case. Um, also on the supplemental, um, Congress has left town without a supplemental bill, uh, without any progress on the supplemental bill. The administration has said that this needs to be done before years end. What's the president doing to engage on this? I mean, look, the president spoke uh, pretty pretty clearly about this the other day uh, and made the case about how Congress uh, needs, to, needs to support Ukraine and so it can fight against Putin. You heard him say that just two days ago, and that is certainly uh, the case. Look. Senate Republicans need to stop playing chicken with our national uh, security. That's what they need to stop doing. Uh, they need, to, uh, they need to, to compromise. They need to have a conversation and compromise uh, so that we can get this done, make sure that we're taking care of our national security. Uh, we have been obviously in touch with, uh, nego- with uh, uh, negotiators on the Hill. We're providing support. Uh, that is something that I, we've said before. But, and the president said that he's willing to compromise. He is, he's willing to compromise, but they can't play chicken with our national uh, security. They cannot do that. Governor Josh Shapiro has called on the University of Pennsylvania's Board of Trustees to meet about President McGill's comments on Capitol Hill. I'm wondering if, the, if President Biden either speak with any of the presidents who testified and 
also would he call for their resignations based on the like, I've been asked this question in many different ways, but what I can tell you for certain is that this is a president that's had moral clarity on this issue when it comes to uh, speaking against anti-Semitism, saying anti-Semitism is unacceptable and it should not be part of who we are as a country. Let's not forget why the president decided to, to get in this election back in 2019. It is to, to make sure that we're fighting against this vile uh, anti-Semitism, this vile hatred that we're seeing. And, uh, you know, he was he was certainly moved by what he saw in Charlottesville, right, with the marching and what they shouted and what was being said. And so we have to fight against that. We have to speak against that. And honestly, we should not be having this conversation. We, we should not be having a conversation on what should be, if we should be denouncing hate or not. It should be an automatic. We should be denouncing hate. We should be denouncing uh, anti-Semitism. It is an automatic. And this president has had moral clarity. I'm just not going to speak to uh, anything beyond that. Are you just on gun? This is a president that has taken more action on uh, on preventing gun violence probably than any other president recently. We're talking about more than two dozen uh, executive actions that he signed. When he signed also uh, the uh, the first kind of uh, uh, legislation on gun violence in 30 years, right? The Safer Communities Act. That was that was also that was done in a bipartisan way and hasn't been done as I just stated in 30 years. That's. The president is taking this incredibly seriously, and he also put to, we, we started and created the first office of for gun prevention, by gun violence prevention. All of these actions have been key and important, and obviously we're going to continue to work and make sure those provisions in that uh, in that law that was the, the first one we've seen in 30 years is is moved quickly, and those executive actions is moved quickly. And the president, as you stated in your question, he wants Congress to act. We must ban. Uh, assault weapons and high capacity magazines enact universal background checks and red flag laws require safe storage of guns and keep keep out of the hands of criminals and dangerous individuals those are things that congress this is in the power of congress to do like gun violence is an epidemic it is an epidemic it is the number one killer of our children and that's should not be no other country is dealing with gun violence the way that we are and so this is for congress republicans in congress need to act they need, we cannot have another, what, we're, what, we're, what we saw just the other day at UNLV. We can't, we cannot. And so we're gonna be steadfast on this. You're gonna hear from the president. Uh, today, he'll speak on what happened uh, at UNLV. Obviously at the top, I mentioned that he was gonna meet with some of the, uh, with the president and some other folks uh, to offer his condolences. And we just, we have to act. Congress needs, Congress, Republicans in particular, need to need to get on board here. And we need to, to continue to work to save lives. But just to meet with them, uh, is he meeting them at the same site uh, where he's making the announcement or is that a separate stop that we're going to go? Well, actually, I think it's the same site, but let me just make sure uh, for, for sure so that I have, I get the logistics right for you. Yeah. Uh, Nevada had like, a horrible Las Vegas had a horrible mass shooting not that long ago and yet I don't think they've done a whole lot to change their gun laws in that city or in that state so what what can the president do to encourage them to act if the, if Congress is not going to look I mean you're talking again you're talking about a president that has taken two dozen executive actions to deal with this epidemic we have an office that is specifically dealing with gun violence, preventing gun violence. He signed the first law in 30 years to deal with gun violence. So the president has taken action and he's going to continue to speak on this. And we are willing, we are offering assistance, whatever it is that states or local government need to deal with this, to deal with gun violence, whatever assistance as we're going as we're doing uh, in Vegas, right? In Las Vegas, we've offered our, any assistance that is needed to help the family, uh, to help them move forward because so much, so much trauma is left after a gun violence like this happens in a community. And look, we're going to continue to speak to it. And I mean, two dozen actions, an office, historic, historic. I mean, these are all historic historic actions that this president has taken you know and you know we have to do everything that we we can to protect lives and protect communities and that's what the president's going to continue to speak to on the middle east maybe uh, according to a new survey published today uh, among adults under age 30 
only 19% approve of the way the president is handling the Gaza crisis. So are you concerned about those numbers? Is the president concerned that he's losing his connection with the younger Americans? Which poll? Which poll it was Pew Research. Uh, it's a survey published today. Okay, so look, you know, when it comes to polls, um, you know, we certainly don't govern by polls, right? Um, you know, uh, when it comes to young people, we've been very, very clear that we take, we take, um, I think we've shown action how, how seriously we take uh, what young people are going through, right? I mean, we have policies that have certainly been guided towards young people, right? Young people care about climate change. This is the president has taken more actions on climate change than any other recent president, any recent president. Uh, you think about uh, education. This is a president that has taken really uh, uh, extensive actions on, on student loan, uh, for giving more than $123 billion uh, of love loan forgiveness because he understands what that means to young people and how much that could be crushing uh, to them. Uh, you think about this issue of the Middle East, the president, you know, has taken, has taken this really seriously. If you think about, we've talked about this, right? We've talked about what it, what, not forgetting what happened on October 7th, right? Not forgetting how 1,200 people were slaughtered by a terrorist organization, Hamas. Hamas is a terrorist organization that has said over and over and over again that they want an October 7th to replay, to repeat. And so the president has to um, support our friends in Israel who are fighting to defend themselves, fighting to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And so that's what we, that's how we see moving forward here. Uh, obviously, obviously we want to make sure that the people in Gaza have humanitarian aid. Obviously, we want to make sure that IDF is more precise and accurate in how they are moving forward with this war. We've been very clear about that. You've heard that from Secretary Blinken. You've heard that um, from our national security uh, advisor. You've heard that from us. Uh, and how that is also important because one life is too many. One innocent civilian life is too many. And so we're going to be have that moral clarity uh, and be very, very um, clear with our, our, our friends uh, in Israel about that. Uh, but they should have the right to defend themselves. And obviously, we do not want to see innocent lives uh, taken, us in, in, um, you know, taken in, in, in Gaza as well. On his uh, statement the other day, uh, that if, if Donald Trump were not running, maybe he wouldn't have decided to run again. Uh, I'm wondering, I mean, I don't know that there's been a modern president, maybe since Coolidge, who's felt that way, that, you know what, I just don't need this job. Someone else can do it, and I've, I've done what I need to do. Every other president since then, I think, has wanted a second term in the case of FDR Moore. Um, what, what does that say about, I mean, uh, this president, is he kind of, Tired of the job, or is it is just a lot? I mean, maybe you can expand on that. Look, going to Vegas right now to make to so the president could speak to this big announcement that he's making, right? Eight billion dollars from the bipartisan infrastructure uh, law that's going to deal with rail. It's an important announcement, right? And so obviously the president is going to continue to be focused on the American people and delivering for the American people. And look, this is also a president I would argue that has done that has had. A historical uh, accomplishments, right? Bipartisan infrastructure law, Inflation Redu Reduction Act, Chips and Science Act, the PACT Act, and those are just in the past year and a half that he's been able to get that done. The first piece of legislation, the American Rescue Plan, that helped to get that helped to get this this our economy back on its feet. Also, only voted by only voted by Democrats. This is a president that wakes up in the morning thinking about how he's going to continue to deliver for the American people. On your question, I'm going to be really careful not to not uh, not to speak about the 2024. But the president actually was asked multiple times about like you know uh, followed up questions about this. He's pretty much answered it right. Clear, clearly, uh, he's running right. Clearly, he believes that uh, uh, it's important for him to do so. Got to be really careful not speak beyond that. But again, we are about to announce something that's historic today historic that's going to make a difference in people's lives, not just in the region that we're going to, but across the country. And that's the that's the president's focus. But just another quick one about the, the, this weekend, specifically the, the what's going on with the Osprey and the grounding of the Osprey. Is that going to affect movement in any way during this trip for us or for anybody else? So I know uh, my colleague at NSC talked about this yesterday. Look, 
out of abundance of caution, the military has grounded the Osprey fleet, as you know, of helicopters while they continue to investigate the recent crash off the coast of Japan. We will always ensure the safety of crew members and all flying passengers, including all of you here today. And we will always have alternate helicopter support for up upcoming travel. So we'll have, to your answer, up, um, uh, alternate helicopter support. So we'll continue to stay in close contact with the military to keep all personnel safe, personnel safe, and would point all of you to the Department of De Defense to have specific, if you have specific information on that. So obviously we'll have alternative uh, alternative ways of getting us all around on this trip. I just don't have anything further or specific to share about that. Department of Defense would have more. But can you say we're using an alternative transportation this week weekend specifically? Yes, we will be using alternative transportation uh, as of today. So the the eight billion that you mentioned is that that's the same eight billion that was uh, mentioned at the Amtrak station visit, right, or the Amtrak. I don't, I'm not going to get ahead. The president certainly will will have more details for you on that in this on, on the supplemental again. Um, British Foreign Secretary Dick Cameron was here at the White House yesterday. Um, what is the administration saying to our closest allies who might be concerned about whether funding will come or not? But people, we've been very clear, right? This it's important for us to get this done, right? What message does that send to our allies? What message does that send to the brave people of Ukraine, right? What that what message does that send to Putin? who wants to see us not continue to fund Ukraine, right? And so this is important. So we've said this, the time is running out, right? They have to do this before the end of recess. They got, we have to continue to fund uh, and, and provide security assistance to Ukraine. We've been very clear about that. They have done something that many people said that they couldn't. They have continued to fight in the past two years and fight against this aggression against Ukraine, against Russia, pardon me, against Mr. Putin, right? Uh, and, and fighting for their freedoms, fighting for democracy. They are fighting against tyranny. That is something that, you know, Republicans in Congress, they need to, they have, I said this yesterday and I'll say this today. They, they history will show uh, or judge them harshly uh, where they stand if we don't get this done, if we don't get this done. So yes, it's important on how our allies are viewing this and seeing this. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.